Welcome to Voices from the Valley, a podcast of the Community Foundation for the Fox Valley Region. I'm Amy Spreeman, and today we have a special treat for you. We are at the Chilton Public Library, and I am here with the Assistant Director of the Chilton Public Library, Rebecca Berry. Hi, Rebecca. How are you? Hi, Amy. I'm pretty good. Yourself? I'm doing great, and a great conversation we're going to have today about lifting up voices uh, from people in the community. That's what we do, and uh, that's what you do, too, through a podcast. And let's talk a little bit about a start of a podcast here at Chilton. Why did you guys decide a podcast would be a good idea? We really initially weren't thinking about one. Uh, We attended the ALA conference and saw StoryCorps was there. Mm -hmm. And then we started talking about, oh, that's a really nice way of being able to not only just share and show representation in the community, but to start recording and sharing stories and making sure that our history is kind of stored somewhere, right? We have an aging community and sometimes we don't think about the history that might be lost uh, because we share that information orally, Mm -hmm. but we don't necessarily keep it recording, that we could keep those like family stories and the expertise, like the lost knowledge that we have out there, but could lose if we don't record it. And so we started thinking about how could we do that? Mm -hmm. And we wanted to start by focusing on three specific types of stories in our community. Uh, We're a rural community Mm -hmm. and we are a farming community. And we wanted to make sure that that knowledge and those stories weren't lost. And that's where we find a lot of people like they share stories orally, but don't record them. And so we were like, all right, We're going to focus on rural voices. And we also have a lot of small businesses in town, rural communities. We don't have a ton of national chains. Their expertise is really something that could be helpful to someone who's considering starting a business. So we wanted to then share like that, that business insight on a small business side. And then we also have a growing Hispanic population. We wanted to make sure that their stories could be shared, not just on their history, but also to allow our community to also develop a deeper understanding of what it could be like to be in a smaller sub-community within our larger community. I want to back up just a little bit because there are people in the Fox Valley who maybe haven't ventured over to Chilton (laughs) and uh, kind of understand what the community is about. It's a very special place to be. Uh, You've, Like you said, you've got uh, the rural community that kind of grew up together. And then you've got new people who've come in. Maybe it's a bedroom community for them and or they just wanted to get away from the city and now they're here. What do we need to know about Chilton? Chilton is a really close-knit community. I like to think of us that we are a small town that is close enough to the larger cities that we get to have like kind of the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. We get to have that close knit, small town feel, but also still be able to experience some of the like bigger city amenities that some other rural communities might not be able to face. Yeah. So we have a diverse community, both in age as well as in ethnic population. And I think it's something that really makes our community special. And I think it's fantastic that we are able to like kind of coexist all together and really make such a vibrant community that really is growing. When people hear your podcasts, is it a a way to bring people together to maybe make them feel more of a part of something? It is. And this is one of the ways that people can really gain an understanding of different communities. Um, I'm a bigger city girl, was not a farming family or anything like that. I can tell you what a cow is, <laughs> but like getting into like the details of cows, um, couldn't tell you. Having something like a podcast like this even allows me to gain a better understanding of what it's like to have to consider work, you know, getting up before the sun is up and not having scheduled breaks. And, you know, can I take a vacation Because like, who's going to, right? The farm doesn't stop. Corn still grows. Cows still need to be milked. So I think that having these stories and this podcast really allows everybody to gain an idea of what it might be like for 
all of the different types of people who live in our community. You have podcast equipment here. We're using it right now. And this is also available for anybody else in the community who wants to start their own podcast or maybe maybe their equipment broke down and they, they just want to give it a try on some new equipment. Tell us about that. Sure. Um, we always think it's important that when we put together programs, we want to make sure that all different elements of education can be accessed and accessible. And podcasts, as we talked about, are a great way to learn about something. And the equipment isn't necessarily cheap. Right. And sometimes, you know, you want to try something and or learn about something and having to invest that kind of money can be really inaccessible then to people. So we thought, you know, we're going to have this podcast. Not only will we have the equipment to make sure that we are putting out a professional uh, product, but that it is something that the community has access to as well. Uh, we really try to have most of the stuff that we have here available to people, be it through books, DVDs, our library of things, the equipment that you can come and use in the makerspace, those kind of things. You know, um, podcast equipment, like you said, podcast equipment is not uh, inexpensive, but you had a special gift. You had some support from the community. Tell us about that. We did. We were uh, graciously awarded a grant through the Chilton Area Community Foundation um, last year that allowed us to be able to purchase this equipment, uh, be able to promote it out to the community so that we could share these voices. If we did not receive that grant, I don't believe that this project would have even been possible for us. And we're so pleased to be able to support you through, especially through our affiliate partner. And uh, it's just such an amazing thing to have these voices. Um, and, and a couple of months ago, you were able to launch your very first podcast. Tell us about that. Sure. We had uh, Jerry Franzen on. He actually is the husband of our director, Glennie Whitcomb. And he graciously agreed to be our test subject for our first podcast so that we could make sure um, that we knew what we were doing as well. We figured that he'd be a little bit more understanding if we had some tech issues and that kind of stuff. Um, and it was such a great time to listen to him talk about what it was like, um, his experiences in farming when he was young and how that has changed to now and his view of farmland and conservation and that. So it was so great to have him here. Well, and I listened to it. It was wonderful. And I would like to play a little snippet of this for our listeners right now. So let's take a listen to Jerry France and talk about his family farm. Welcome to Sharing Our Stories, the podcast where the vibrant tapestry of our community unfolds through the voices of its residents. Brought to you by the Chilton Public Library, this series invites you to embark on a journey of discovery as we delve into the personal narratives, cherished memories, and unique experiences that make our town truly special. Join us as we celebrate the diverse stories that weave together the fabric of Chilton, Wisconsin, one captivating tale at a time. Sit back, listen, and let the power of storytelling connect us all. This is Sharing Our Stories. Hello, today is October 3rd, 2023. I am Glennie Whitcomb with the Chilton Public Library, and today I am interviewing Jerry Franz and my husband, and we are going to have a conversation about farming, growing up farming in Calumet County. And I was wondering, Jerry, if you could describe a little bit about the journey of your family farm in Stockbridge, Wisconsin, and how it was evolved over the years, or would you rather talk about a memory well there was a sense of belonging when you're growing up on a in a small community there was never a need to feel you had to compete because there's always always seemed to be enough for everyone around so you could always just kind of make it by without competing with other people to get the same same material stuff would you say that if you if there was something you couldn't do or didn't have, you could network with others to... You could... Oh, sure. You know, the neighbors would still come over and help and share the equipment. But now, because the farms are so large and everybody needs the equipment all at the same time, it doesn't really happen anymore. In a world that's becoming increasingly urbanized, what do you think 
are the most important aspects of rural life in the area that should be preserved for future generations, sort of addressing what you just said about how it's changing? Probably one of the main ones would be to keep the the natural areas which are still existing intact and not let them be uh, further damaged or developed. Mm -hmm. Because once they're gone, they're not going to be coming back. Jerry, can you describe the journey of your family farm and how it's evolved over the years? Well, probably the ones I can remember would be from the 40s or 40s and mid 50s when the family had a 60 acre farm and the 60 acres supported a family of six. And we never felt, not even in simple ways, not having things. We just never thought about it. It was always food and, and shelter and cars to go places. So we just never thought about that it was a small family farm. It was just something that everyone did. Would you say <clears> driving <throat> up and down the highway where your farm is that there were many more farms uh, like yours? It was everybody had that small 25 to 30 cow farm, 60 acres supported a family. Every neighbor was a farmer. And now you may have four or five big dairies in Calumet County versus four or 500 small dairies. What are the some of the most rewarding aspects of being a farmer in a rural community? And what are the biggest challenges you've faced? Probably being surrounded by the natural world all the time and working in it and working with the family on the farm and making things happen and discovering things. It was a, a lifestyle versus a money-making enterprise. It was, it was a different and, way. Well, right, right. We survived. Mm-hmm. What was the biggest challenge? What are some of the biggest challenges that that involved? Like, were there ever any health issues or any? We were always lucky. We never had health is- issues the family. Mm-hmm. But always, there was always something. There was always work. You never finished with your work. Mm-hmm. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So a blessing and a was, curse. Yes. There was always something to be done. Mm-hmm. It's not like you could just take off two weeks and go on vacation because that wasn't a possibility. What about danger? Of course, there's always danger in the farm. Could you share a memorable story or experience from your life as a farmer that has had a lasting impact on you? Probably, you know, learning the value of hard work and just sticking with problems and solving them and not giving up. You don't give up. And you learn how to do things on your own. What matters most to you and why? At the Community Foundation for the Fox Valley Region, we know you care about the causes and issues that impact your life and the lives of your neighbors. Maybe it's education or affordable housing or our great outdoors. There are so many ways you can impact lives and make the Fox Valley an even better place to live for all. Let us know what matters to you. Learn more at cffoxvalley.org slash matters. Together, we flourish. The Community Foundation for the Fox Valley Region works to strengthen our community today and for generations to come by helping people, businesses, and organizations make a difference in the lives of all. Get in the loop. Stay informed about what's happening in the Fox Valley through the Community Foundation. Our blog shares stories of impact about the arts, education, community improvement, healthcare, human services, and the environment. Sign up at cffoxvalley.org backslash loop. See how giving matters. We are back with the Assistant Director of the Chilton Public Library, Rebecca Berry. Thanks for being back with us again, Rebecca. Thanks for having me. Well, I want to talk a little bit about the culture that you have here in Chilton and the way that you're serving the community with these different voices. And uh, these podcasts are actually expanding, aren't they? You're, you're actually branching into different areas. They are. We actually figured we had this podcast available and let's play around with it a little bit. So we are looking at starting one that kind of focuses on a deeper dive on pop culture and entertainment and looking at some of the materials we have, books, movies, 
maybe our games, our library of things, those kind of things, and do a little deeper analysis on that, just on a fun, like entertaining way. Something that maybe we look at and we go, oh, that'd be interesting to explore. Yeah. Or maybe just something that goes, huh, is that what we thought it said? And then ha- bringing guests on about those kind of things. And just seeing about different ways that we can reach out to the community in other ways besides social media, our newsletters, those kind of things. Well, libraries are really becoming a hub, again, of that that third place that you go and gather in the community. And uh, so I imagine that this podcast is great for people who, uh, you know, might not get to come to the library, but they can still hear about their community. It is. We really think accessibility is important, as we had said before. Um, we try to offer virtual programs as well so that if you can't make it to the library, you can still participate, feel part of the community. Uh, one of the things that we did, we run a Strong Bodies program, which is a fitness program. And we actually, for the participants, we would record one of those sessions each week so that you could, if you couldn't make it, you could watch the fitness program. There's an aspect of feeling as part of a community. It gives you that sense that you are there even if you're not. Uh, We do the same. We have a meditation program that we run on our YouTube channel. We've had author talks that we've done on Facebook Live. So this is just another element of accessibility to patrons who might be homebound, who might just be stuck at home because of the weather. We have some patrons who, especially in the winter, when it gets dark out, they don't want to travel. And this way we can, you can always participate in the library no matter what your schedule is. Yes. And when you were designing all the episodes that you were thinking of before you even launched this podcast, what were some of the voices that you wanted to make sure if you were going to have a diverse community representation? Tell me a little bit more about some of those uh, voices that you really want to capture. We really thought about, like, we had kind of a list. We have a list, I should say, of people that are on, like, our definite list that we want to talk to. There are some businesses in town here who've been here for a really long time, right? They've been able to weather economic factors, community factors, you know, growing or shrinking community. But we also have brand new businesses that, you know... How was it to, you know, work through the challenges of COVID as a brand new business, maybe people moving into the community that is an entirely different community than where they're at? We have one coming up through our Hispanic voices where she moved from Peru to Chicago and she lived in Lima in Peru, big city. She lived in Chicago, big city, but moved here to Chilton then. And there was a bit of a culture shock on there. So, oh, right, sure. we wanted yeah. to make sure that we could have like those kind of stories that we felt really gave an idea of not just what it's like to live outside the community, but then how outsiders initially experienced our community for the first time. So those are like, we wanted to make sure that we highlighted those. And so we have a, a list of people that we're, that we've been reaching out. <laughs> I'm so excited to listen to your future episodes. Um, I did get a chance to listen to your second episode that you launched, and this was the lasting impact of the Boy Scouts. Tell us a little bit about that one. Sure. Uh, I personally am involved in Boy Scouts. I'm an adult leader, uh, but our local scout troop meets here at the library. And one of the scout leaders has been involved in scouting for a very long time. I believe it is, if it isn't 50 years, it is nearly 50 years of scouting. Our Boy Scout troop has been around for over 100 years. So we thought there's a lot of people who participated in Boy Scouts that live in the community and it was a lasting impact on their lives. And we thought it would be really nice to share how it impacted one community member. Well, let's take a listen to that podcast right now, that episode about the lasting impact of the Boy Scouts. Take a listen. This is Glennie at the Chilton Public Library having a conversation with Scott Sontag about Boy Scouts, your experience. Good evening. Good evening. How did you first find out about Boy Scouts? The first clue that about Boy Scouts was really in grade school when I saw um, other boys in the grades wearing Cub Scout uniforms. And I didn't know it at the time, but my father had been a Boy Scout and had never shared his experiences with me. So I was never signed up for Boy, for uh, Cub Scouts, 
But after fifth grade, my parents decided that it was time and signed me up for the Boy Scout troop that was at my mother's church. I believe what had happened is that the representative had come to school and then handed something out. Mm. And because it was at my mother's church, she immediately decided that that's what I was going to do with my time. What town? What city? Sheboygan. The north side of Sheboygan. Um, The troop itself had actually been in existence since 1917. So it was one of the oldest, actually one of the oldest troops in the state. And is the camp the same camp that continues to be used by the Boy Scouts? So the camp camp that you're speaking about is Camp Rokolayo. Um, It actually was founded in 1924. Mm. And from what I gather, my troop at the time had been going there forever. Um, They tell of times of actually going out to that area starting as early as 1917. Mm -hmm. So, yes, Camp Rokolayo was where we had always gone. And up until it actually changed from a Boy Scout camp to the to a Cub Scout camp, we had gone there almost every year. Mm hmm. From probably nineteen, probably nineteen twenty four, all the way to up to about nineteen ninety eight. Um, tell me, uh, when did you? How old in Boy Scouts? Because I'm not familiar with Boy Scouts. How old are you when you start being a counselor, like a camp counselor? Or... So the average counselor starts usually at about age sixteen. Mm-hmm. That's when you can actually be employed by the Boy Scouts themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, I started at age sixteen, working in the kitchen. And worked my way up to working on the waterfront staff the next year at mm-hmm. 17. So uh, these days you can actually start in unpaid positions as young as 14. Hmm. I always think of, like, say you graduate, you do your Eagle Scout. Oh, what was your Eagle Scout project? My Eagle Scout project um, came about because of a, a, a rather traumatic incident with my brother. Uh, my brother was at the age of six, was actually hit by a car. Mm-hmm. And it laid him up in traction for 42 days. So with his leg in the air, a pin is like my father came up with the idea of building an adjustable easel for him to put over his legs and his body so that he could write in a vertical fashion. So my project actually was to create a dozen easels for the two hospitals, both in child size and in adult size. And they were adjustable easels that the whoever was using them would actually put them over and they could write and do whatever they wanted with a little tray on the bottom mm-hmm. so that they could put all of their writing thing, utensils on. Who designed this easel? Um, my father actually did. Mm-hmm. He came up with the initial idea. We refined it a bit. And in a matter of about three weekends, we had built, painted, and actually put a really nice Boy Scout logo on them so everybody would know who they nice. were who they were from. What a great project. And from what I understand, they were in use as is for about two decades. Wow. They were still using them 20 years later. That's cool. It, it was a neat project. How would how would you like the scouts that you have mentored to remember you? Uh, I think one of the things that I probably want to be remembered is that I was consistent and how I dealt with everyone, I was not afraid to talk all the time. I was interested. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the young men, especially here, that had a little more troubling past, um, one of the things that hit me was that when he was talking about being in Scouts, one of the things that he said was, you cared whether I was there or not. And I think we were probably the only source in his life for that Mm -hmm. is that we cared to see him and that we cared and i think that's what i'd probably want to be remembered for more than anything else Mm -hmm. absolutely there's nothing better than a young man coming in to maybe his second scout meeting and you remember his name looking back what advice would you give to yourself in your first year of boy scout leading wow that's I think what I I think what I do is write more of it down mm. so that you can remember it. I think keeping more of a journal mm-hmm. would have been helpful. I know my wife has asked me a couple of times, well, why don't you just write a book about it? You talk about it all the time. Mm-hmm. So I think that would have been much more helpful from that standpoint had I written a little more of it down. 
Mm -hmm. The memories are all there. The pictures are there. The places we went to. I think the other thing is I had a unique experience in that I was one of the few scoutmasters who actually had young men from the Hmong community mm -hmm. join his Boy Scout troop at a very early time in the early 1990s. And somebody asked me, you know, how do you recruit or how do you keep these kids here? And I said, I treat them like kids. I treat them like young men. And I let them do what anybody else does. So it was, it was, that was another very unique experience because at the time I was probably the only, I hate to say it, but I was probably the only white scoutmaster of a mostly Hmong troop mm -hmm. in the state at the time. That is unusual. It was unusual. And I still, one of the young men actually just got back from Thailand. Mm -hmm. So I get to talk to him on a regular basis. Well, thanks for giving us an idea of your experience with Boy Scouts. It sounds like it's been very rich and varied. It, it really has. And none of it is wasted time. It is the idea that it is one of the few organizations around that still maintains basically its same ethics, its same code, its same ideal. It hasn't changed mm -hmm. in a hundred plus years. We're still using the same scout oath and law that they had said back in 1910. Mm -hmm. It's still using the same set of rules. And when you take a look at what it does and the results, it's hard to argue with it. Mm -hmm. We are back with our final segment. And Rebecca, thanks so much for this. How can people find you? How, how can people listen to your podcast? Sure. Right now, you can find our podcast either on our YouTube channel or you can go to our website, which is chiltonlibrary.org. And we have a sharing our stories scroll on our page and it will take you right to where you can access all the episodes. We are working on having it pushed out to the other podcast providers so that you can find us pretty much on your smartphone or any way you access podcasts. So we're trying to make it really easy for people. Yeah. And people can subscribe through your YouTube channel. They can. So they can get new episodes as you release them. Yes. I just want to ask you, too, a little bit about uh, how people can share their stories. Because if somebody in Chilton is listening and they think to themselves, well, I've got a story I want to share. How can they get in touch with you? We would love for them to reach out to us. They can give us a call. They can stop in. They could shoot us over an email. You can get our contact information right on our Facebook or our website. They can just ask. They could be like, you know, I think either this person would have a really interesting story or I would love to be able to share my experience. We want to hear from all different voices in the community because I think it's really important for us to have a really good understanding of what it's like for for each person. Everyone has a different experience. And I think that experience can be educational to us all, as well as informative. Well, thank you so much for being on the program. I, I wonder if there's anything that I haven't asked you about yet that you'd like to make sure that our listeners heard. I really like to stress, we really are immensely grateful to the Chilton Area Community Foundation for their support in this project and projects in the past. I would recommend to anybody, if you haven't heard about them, definitely check yes. them out. If you can support them in some way, please do, uh, because they are a valuable member to not just our organization, but I know to many organizations within the Chilton area. Yeah, they really make an impact in the community. And and that's thanks to the generous donors, too, who support through their donations and charitable gifts. So we'll make sure that we have all of the links in our uh, show notes today that you can find. And uh, thank you so much for listening to our podcast today, Voices from the Valley, a podcast of the Community Foundation for the Fox Valley region. You can uh, go to our website, cffoxvalley.org slash podcast, and uh, give us a, a listen. Make sure that you subscribe and uh, get our podcast delivered to you wherever you listen to your audio and your favorite places to download. We will see you next time on Voices from the Valley. Mm -hmm.